Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. This is the first joint seminar of uh, the Institute of Computer Science, Mathematics and Physics. And uh, we're very grateful today to have Professor Mike Edmonds here from Cardiff University. And what better subject to start this as the Antikythera mechanism? Because it is actually relevant in mathematics, physics and computer science. Mike is educated at the University of Cambridge, where he received his PhD, but has spent most of his academic life in Cardiff, over 40 years. And uh, he was uh, head of school there. He's also the chair of the uh, international research project that led to this fantastic result that he's going to talk to us about. But I actually met Mike at an event at the IOP about teaching quantum mechanics. And I think Mike is one of the few physicists I know who really have a very broad um, interest in physics. And um, he's also very good at uh, giving presentations, so I'm, I'm sure we will all very much enjoy his talk. His main research area, actually, before starting this uh, project, is on uh, the formation of chemical elements in the early universe and interstellar dust. dust. So you can again see this. A uh, breadth of subjects that he's covering. So, Mike, thank you very much for making the long trip to Aberystwyth. Please go ahead. Thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you very much. Uh, can you all hear me at the back, all right? Yeah, okay. Um, I didn't realize there were so many people in Aberystwyth. <laughs> um, such a long time since I was last here. Uh, it's delightful to visit, visit again. Uh, thank you for asking me. Now, I want to take you back today um, to the classical world. Um, it's something which I didn't know very much about, the classical world, until I started doing research on this remarkable artifact I'm going to tell you about. But it's been a great pleasure for me, somewhat late in life, to discover the delights of a classical education. Uh, I want to take you back to about 100 BC to begin with. Now, 100 BC, for those of you, I, I don't actually remember it, I've only read about it. Uh, but for those of you who do remember your uh, classics lessons, if you ever had any, um, Greece was still a power to be reckoned with. It still wasn't a bad place to live. But the golden days of Greece had passed. By 100 BC, the golden days of Greece were maybe, what, 300, 400, 500 years in the past. And by 100 BC, there was a new kid on the block. All around the Western Mediterranean, the Romans were conquering and coming. The uh, empire hadn't been declared yet. That wasn't going to happen for another 50 years or so. Um, but it was undoubtedly, you know, who was going to take over and was already taking over. And it's from this sort of time of flux in the classical world between the Greek, great Greek civilization and the great Roman civilization uh, that the artifact I'm going to talk about comes from. So... Uh, as Daniel mentioned, this is an international um, research effort. It's involved uh, people in Greece, in the UK, and in the USA. And here are some of the names. I won't go through them all, just a few of them. Uh, Tony Freeth, a, a guy who's done an awful lot of work uh, on this work with me for a while uh, in Cambridge. He works in London. He was actually a filmmaker. Yanni Gitsakis, uh, who, who was the, uh, another of the postdocs on the project, uh, worked um, at the University of Athens with Xenophon Moussas, a professor of uh, space sciences. John Seridakis is a fairly well known uh, Greek radio astronomer. Agamemnon Salakis is, is our pet epigrapher, and epigrapher is somebody who looks at texts. And from the way the texts are written, can tell you to some extent when it was written and where it was written. <coughs> Very useful. And uh, we had to have good relationships with the National Archaeological Museum in Athens, where this object resides. And that was Elena Mungo and Maria, well, I'll just say Maria, I think. Um, and we had great help from two industrial concerns uh, XTech, which is a, was an actual outfit in uh, Tring in the United Kingdom in Hertfordshire. They were recently taken over by Nikon Metrology. And one of, a part of Hewlett Packard, one of the Hewlett Packard sort of outfits from Silicon Valley in California, and you'll, you'll see the contribution they made later on. And more recently, we've been joined by various uh, 
historians of science, particularly in the USA. Now, I just think, I mentioned this, to have sort of a, a xenophon and agamemnon that taking part in the research, I think gives a certain cachet to the research, if nothing else. Um, I will mention we did have some funding for this during the two, two years of 2005 to 2000, 2004 to 2006. We were funded by the Levy Hume Foundation, which is absolutely uh, vital in uh, being able to do the experimental work. So here are some mug shots, just in case you will see them in the street and want to walk on the other side. <coughs> and the various industrial uh, teams as well. Okay, now, I'm going to talk about Greece, so let me remind you where Greece is, nice and sunny and a long way away. Um, here are, we are out here somewhere, on the edge of the known world. Um, and here's the Eastern Mediterranean. Okay, the Eastern Mediterranean, and really where I'm going to start talking about is down here in the Eastern Mediterranean, this part down here. So if I <laughs> zoom in there, there's Athens, there's Crete, there's Rhodes. How many people have been to either Crete, Athens, or Rhodes? Gosh, you are a well off lot, aren't you? Okay. So you at least have some idea of where we are. So that's where we are. There's Rhodes, there's Crete, there's Athens. And in this part of the Mediterranean, there's an island called Kithara. You can see it there, it's the island of Kithara. And across the strait from it is an island called Anti Kithara. Sort of in front of or opposite Kithara. And that's obviously what's going to give name to this particular artifact I'm going to talk about. Now what happened was, in 1900, some sponge divers were coming from their home in Sime, which is over here, in a boat across to North Africa, which is where they hunted their, well, hunted their sponges, I suppose. They probably, probably just picked them up. <laughs> anyway, uh, what they learned in the meanwhile, they were collecting sponges from the bottom of the sea. They had diving suits to do this. And uh, they were coming across the Mediterranean to, to go to North Africa, which is where they did most of their gathering, and a storm blew up. Now, the Mediterranean, you may think of as a very quiet sea or whatever, it's in fact quite a dangerous sea. And it can have very violent and sudden storms, as is witnessed, in fact, as we'll see in a minute by a shipwreck, but many shipwrecks on the Mediterranean. Anyway, they sheltered in the lee of the island of Antikythera until the storm blew itself out. And then they decided they'd dive. We didn't, I don't know whether they did that because they wanted to, to see if they had sponges down there or to get some clams for lunch, whatever. Anyway, a couple of them dived down. And a few minutes later, one of them came up clutching a bronze arm and saying there's a shipload of maidens down there. Well, when they calmed him down, um, and they realised what they'd found, in fact, was the wreck of a Roman-era trading ship. And this trading ship, when they went down, they found some artefacts already, and uh, realised that this was going to be, you know, this, it was quite important. So they wondered what they should do. So they thought, well, we'd better tell the authorities. It only took six months to decide to do that. Um, and when they had done that, the Greek Navy and the National Archaeological Museum in Athens mounted a joint expedition to go and investigate what was down on the ship. It was really, basically, the first proper underwater archaeology ever done. And it was done in 1901, 1902, um, over the seasons then. And here you can see a picture from 1902, uh, one of the ships used uh, in, in the expedition. And can you see this thing here, this sort of lump? Here. Yeah? Is it visible from the back? <coughs> yeah, that might form the seat here. Okay. That is that. <laughs> this ship contained, I say the shipwreck contained some of the finest known um, classical era bronzes. It was stuffed full of nice things. It also contained marble statuary and even fine glassware. And that looks like something out in the 1920s, it's very likely, but it, that was from the, from the wreck. Fantastic hoard of, of stuff uh, on the ship. And in fact, this year, if any of you, I, I don't know if anybody has been to Athens this summer. Anybody been to Athens since last summer? <coughs> You're Greek. Excellent. Um, <laughs> I think that's right. I, well, the first time I visited Greece, um, I, I was told you should stay in the morning, Camilara. 
you know, if you go and you say calamari, and sit things say. So I went to the first boy and said calamari. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, welcome. Anyway, uh, the National Archaeological Museum in Athens has put on a special exhibition of the stuff from the Antipathera wreck. And it's a fabulous ex ex exhibition with loads of stuff you can't normally see uh, except it. It's, it's a really good exhibition. Ex 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 it's going on, I think, until next August. I've extended it, in fact. So if anybody is there early next summer or over the summer, well worth going and having a look at it. Anyway. Also brought up with all this wonderful stuff was a lump, which wasn't to me should be recognised at the time. Might be maybe a lump about this size. My guess is they probably thought it was something like with a statue, perhaps a head of a small statue or something like that. It was taken back with all the other stuff, which was all taken back and put in the National Archaeological Museum in Athens. And a couple of months later, it split open. Now, whether this was because it had dried out, because of drying out, it split. Or because somebody hit it with a hammer, we don't know, but it did split open. And I think one of the government ministers was going around and he pointed and he said, What's that? And uh, um, I presume something that's a lump of bronze, sir, or words to that effect. He said, Well, why has it got gear wheels in it? And they said, What? And if you notice here, can you see there is a gear wheel here? This is this is uh, after a lot of cleaning and so on. This is going for 82 separate fragments. There's another gear wheel here, there's another gear wheel here. And this big wheel itself is also a gear wheel. Now, gear wheels were not known at this time. No sort of metal precision gear wheels were known from the classical world at this time. So they already knew that this was something special because the gear wheels just weren't known from this age. Um, for purposes later on, I shall call this gear wheel the chariot wheel. It's nothing to do with chariots, but you know what I mean. Okay? I'll call that the chariot wheel because that uh, will provide us with a reference point. You'll see the teeth better later on. Now, the fact that it had gears on it, uh, in, in it was already special. But it wasn't really realised until the 1960s, 1970s, when radiography of the main fragments was done, that it was realised how special it was. The first radiography was done by a guy called Karakalos, and it, in conjunction with a guy who I'll show a picture of in a minute called uh, Derek de Sola Price, and they discovered that the main fragment had something like 27 gears in. And overall, from the fragments, we know 30 gears in the fragments. 30. Now, the remnants are incomplete, but 30 gears is much more complicated than any device known <coughs> for at least a millennium afterwards. It's not until you get to the era of the medieval cathedral clocks around 1100, 1200, 1300 AD do you get anything as complicated as this. So it really is a quite remarkable machine. Here are three of the fragments just shown. Um, now you have a choice here. Is, it, is, this, is the lighting too bright for you? If I turn it down it's going to be dark and you'll all go to sleep. Would you prefer the, the lights down, or can you see all right? If you find, if you'd like the lights put down, please raise your hand now. If you'd like the displays they are, please raise your hand now. Okay, on a zenith vote, therefore we have it that we go into the dark. Okay, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I'll raise them up in a few minutes, just to, perhaps halfway through, just to give you a, a shot and get it working again. Yeah. Okay, it's the problem is it's not. Is that all right? Yes. Okay, right, now no story. Uh, now, just, just to give you some idea of the size of the three main fragments, I'll show you all the fragments in a minute. Here's a sort of standard sized Greek guard, okay? And here are the three main fragments. Of the, 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 there's several main fragments, so the three uh, most well known ones. Here's the second fragment. Now, second surprise about this machine. Not only does it have gear wheels, it has the first known scientific scales or dials. And you see here, these are scientific dials. And they're not simple, they're complicated in some way. Okay, first known ones. And here's the fragment C. Now, that says, well, it's about that size. Okay? <coughs> about that size. It's a cruel enlargement. But can you see the nicely divided scale here? Yeah. And the other thing that's useful about the mechanism is, as you can see on the outside here, a lot of the surface of the mechanism or plates that were in the front of the mechanism are covered 
with Greek inscriptions. Okay? It's a bit like, you know, sort of, you know these flat packs from Ikea. They, they can take instructions when you get instructions for them. But unfortunately, just like Ikea, most of the instructions, a lot of them are missing. At least there's something there. Okay. Now, before we started work, there are various heroes in the history of this subject, particularly Derek the Soviet Christ, who was a British physicist who went and worked in uh, the United States, and he worked on sociology of science, on the history of science, and worked a lot on the antithetical mechanism, and around 1976-77 uh, produced a book, or a paper that became a book, called uh, Gears from the Greeks. And that remains the Bible, really, of the studies. It was a wonderful work, although he had a slightly, he had a slight tendency to make things, interpret things in its own way, and force things to fit. But apart from that, it's a wonderful scholarship. <laughs> Also, a guy who you might see if you see any television programs on this uh, subject is a guy called Michael Wright, who's a, a craftsman. He, he, in fact, he was a curator of mechanical engineering at the Science Museum in London, and he's had a lot of insights in making and constructing replica anti-Kiffer mechanisms. You can see him playing with one here, and some of the insights that I talk about are very much down to him. So, what about the date for this device? I talked about 100 BC. Let me just go through why we think we know the date fairly well. At least uh, time team wouldn't be, a, wouldn't be ashamed of the date. On the shipwreck, there are some coins that uh, come from Pergamon in the eastern Mediterranean, and they can be dated to around 86 to 60 BC. Now, presumably the ship had, couldn't sink before the coins had been minted, so that gives you some sort of date for the shipwreck itself. Although, well, there must be mechanism can be older than the ship. There's no reason why it should be about the uh, same age as the ship. The ship's timbers were, until quite recently, a bit of a problem, because the radiocarbon dates that were given for the ship's timbers, is this coming in and out of, if um, I'm imagining it? Um, I'll try that, see if that's any better. Is that more consistent? Can you still hear me? Right, okay. If it goes wrong again, I'll <coughs> keep letting me out. The ship's timbers until recently were a bit of a problem because the radiocarbon date was much older than the date that we had of the shipwreck, which seemed unlikely because ships, certainly that year, wouldn't have lasted too long in active service. However, um, this year, a re or just at the end of last year, a recalibration of the date was done using the original data but with a more modern calibration scale. And now, which is really rather nice, the 85 or 85% probability limits for the date is between 211 and 40 BC, which just nicely covers that date and the date that we have from the epigraphy on the, on the machine. Remember I said about the epigraphy that the form of the letters can give you some information <coughs> on when the lettering was made, because the Greek script changes subtly but noticeably on a 30 to 40 year time scale. And our epigraphers are pretty confident that the data of the stuff on the mechanism is the late 2nd century BC, so that's around 100, 120 <coughs> BC. So those three all together are nicely consistent. And I'll mention some sort of collateral rather than actual, actual dating evidence. Cicero, the great Roman orator, talks about devices like the Antipithero mechanism in several of his books. And he reports that in Crete, not in Crete, sorry, in Rhodes, when he visited a guy called Posidonius, he saw something like the Antikythera mechanism. We obviously want the Antikythera mechanism itself, something like it. And we know that he visited Rhodes sometime between about 80 and 40 BC. We don't know exactly what he did because he wrote about this much later in life. But sometime between 80 and 40 BC. So we know there were machines of this kind around, around this sort of date. So taking all of those together, 140 to 100 BC is not a bad date. That can't be wrong by more than about 30 years, which isn't bad for, a, for an archaeological dating. And just to remind you, this is particularly for the astronomers here, a quick reminder of the astronomical history. There will be a test later, there will be multiple choice with one essay. Um, here are some of the major uh, figures in the classical astronomy. Don't worry too much about it. The ones you've read are people who wrote books that are, are known about. Archimedes you may have heard of. 
He was about 287 to 212 BC, and we're fairly sure that he did play with such a maybe design such mechanisms. Ptolemy, you'll have heard of, the great Roman era astronomer who wrote the great Almagest, the great book that sort of everybody threw everything else away, which is a bit of a shame, you'll probably know more about the period before if they hadn't written such a good book. Um, around about 85 to 165 AD. And the Antikythera thing is sort of in the middle of that lot, sort of between Archimedes and Ptolemy. When we started work, what we wanted to do was to get complete surface imagery of all of the surfaces of the remaining fragments, to get tomographic x rays. In other words, like a body scan, you know the body scans in the hospital, which give you a complete 3D reconstruction of the brain, or whatever. We wanted to do that to the, to, to the remain fragments, because if we could get the spatial information, we believe we could get a much better crack at trying to reconstruct the functions of the instruments. Some functions were known, but the complete reconstruction had not been done. And we wanted complete data, and then to put it into context. So there, to relative size, those are correct relative sizes, are the remaining 82 fragments of the mechanism. And that's very more in the drawers in Athens that we noticed now, but they've had a look and they can't find any more. Those are the main fragments you can see at the top here. I'll show you that one, that one, and that one really, but some other fragments as well. Um, some of these small ones, they don't have anything on, perhaps have one letter of text. Most of the mechanism and most of the inscriptions are in these larger fragments. Now, to give you some idea of what it must have looked like when it was uh, original, there was some sort of front door or front door plate that had inscriptions on. Then on the front of the mechanism, there was a big dial, which basically showed the signs of the zodiac around, and a pointer to show where the sun was in the zodiac, a pointer to show where the moon was, and also a half silver ball that showed the phase of the moon. Uh, now you may often have seen that in you may have seen that in long case clocks sometimes have that mechanism in. Leonardo da Vinci invented it or reinvented it in one of his sketchbooks. It occurs in many bits of it's been reinvented again and again over history, but the Greeks were certainly the earliest we know about uh, that nice little bit of mechanism. There were also inscriptions on the front. On the back of the device, there were two big dials, one at the top and one at the bottom. When we started work, nobody knew what they were, but by the end of this lecture, hopefully you will know what they are. And then on the back, there were more inscriptions. The first mechanism, the first technique we used to look at the mechanism came from Hewlett Packard in the United States, a guy here called Tom Maltzbender, who Hewlett Packard employed to help with designing their copiers. And what happens, I think, once a month, somebody comes and says, look, we're having a problem with this copy. And he looks at it and he says, we should take, you know, redesign that very slightly and put a new widget there. And that saves them $2 million or something. And then they leave them alone for a month. And he just gets on inventing things. And what he invented uh, is this mechanism called uh, poly polynomial textural mapping. And what it works is the following. You, you've got a hemisphere, you can see the sign of it here, with 50 flash colors on it. A digital camera plugs in the top, and that goes to a laptop, and you have some pretty smart software. <coughs> you put whatever it is inside the hemisphere and fire off the flash bulbs one at a time, taking a digital picture each time. Dump them into the computer, and you just take it away on a stick or memory. Plug it into your computer at home, and it's, you put it up on the screen, and it's as though you're holding the thing, and you can turn it relative to the light, because you can relight. And that allows you to see fine detail. Uh, those of you who are great time, I won't, nobody admits to watching Time Team, I know that, okay? But if you do happen to be a closet Time Team watcher, you will know that one good way of seeing faint surface features is to go up in a balloon or a helicopter or whatever airplane at dawn or dusk when there's glancing at incidents of the sunlight. Because if you see that going across the field, you can often pick up bumps and bumps below the ground from the instant light. And that's what this machine basically does. For example, here's a fragment, and this is uh, what we call the Isle of Wight fragment. And uh, most of this had, in fact, been decoded before we started work, but some of it hadn't been confirmed. But if you apply, that's what it looks like if you pick it up. If you apply the technique of the PTMs, you see it's a lot easier 
to see what's going on with a bit of little simple image processing. Now, if you zoom in on that uh, fragment there, you'll see that there are three numbers on it. Three numbers. <coughs> the numbers 76, 19, and 223. Now, the astronomers among you will immediately recognize the <coughs> fundamental importance of these numbers. At least, perhaps 100 years or 200 years ago, you might have done. They are not numbers that are not so, that are well known today, but in the classical times, certainly, certainly in more recent times, would have been known a lot better than they are now. And so you say, very important for understanding the mechanism. I'm going to talk a little bit about them. Now, 19, what's the number 19? 19 is the number of years in a metonic cycle. Now, Meton was a Greek astronomer of about the uh, 4th century BC, if I remember rightly, who took over from the Babylonians a whole load of results into the Greek world, or is reputed to have brought them across, they probably came across in many ways, uh, about observations of the heavens. The Babylonians were great astronomers, great observational astronomers. Over hundreds of years, they meticulously watched the sky and recorded the motion of the sun, the moon, and the planets. And they recorded them on things like this, the little um, cuneiform clay tablets. And there are thousands of these in existence. The British Museum has lots and lots. I don't know if the National Library of Wales might have some, for all I know. Might well have some. Um, dug up in places like Iraq. We heard the ones in Iraq are just sitting below the soil, just waiting to be rediscovered later on. Um, but there are thousands of these. A lot of them are dealing just with taxes and records of various kinds, but a large number are astronomical. And with these many centuries of observations, um, the Babylonians have noticed certain cycles. And the 19 year one is a very important one called a sedimentonic cycle. Now let me explain what this does. You will have noticed. I trust by now that you haven't got a whole number of lunar months in a year. They're not an in integral number of lunar months in a year. That's jolly annoying, isn't it? Because um, if there were, suppose there were 13 lunar months in a year, it would be really useful because then you, you know the full moon was going to be on your birthday in July the 15th. And so you'd have a barbecue. And you'd have the light for it. Okay. Now it's not so important these days, but in classical times, to know when it was going to be full on your moon was important partly for tangible reasons, for farming reasons, but also particularly for ritual reasons. A lot of religious ceremonies had to be performed on the full moon or on the new moon. So you'd like to know when in the year the full moons are going to occur. You want to align the solar year with the lunar calendar. Lunar months. We have other months, you know, we have around January, February, March, April, to fit in rather than having lunar months, because the lunar months don't fit in. Well, there's one little trick that they notice, and it makes it much easier to make calendars, and that is that 19 years is almost exactly equal to 235 lunar months. And a lunar month, I'll talk about the lunar month I mean by that, is full moon to full moon, or new moon to new moon, say. Okay? So 235 full moons will take up 19 years. So you make a calendar, right? to, to bring that out, say, what's the date today? <laughs> yes, that's his watch! <laughs> the 25th of February. And what is the lunar phase tonight? Full moon. It is, you're right, it's full moon tonight. In 19 years' time, on February the 25th, it will also be a full moon. That's it. I've set all the months in between now. You can work out all the months and new moons, whatever you want from, from that thing. So it's a very useful thing to know. Once you know that, you've set out your lunar calendar uh, over the solar years. Now, 76 is called a calibic cycle. And in fact, that is four metonic cycles minus one day. Because that's even more accurate. We won't worry about that, but if you, if you want to create on your that, that's so. They knew about that too. Now, what about the 223 here? Anybody like a guess? Any astronomers want to chance an arm? No, they're all looking at the ceiling. Right, for 223 lunar months is the number of months in a Seros cycle of eclipses. 
Serocyte photosynthesis is like this. If an eclipse occurs, either at new moon or full moon, new moon would have to be a solar eclipse, full moon it'd be a lunar eclipse. Then 223 months later, lunar months later, an almost exactly similar eclipse occurs, but about eight hours later. Okay? So if you've got a table of old eclipses, you know when eclipses have occurred, you can work out when there is a likelihood that another eclipse will occur. And it works really well. It, it works this way over several centuries. You, you see these series of Seros series of eclipses occurring. Now, of course, if it's a solar eclipse, they're quite localised on the surface of the Earth. So you, you can't say there will be another solar eclipse in 223 here. But you know there's a likelihood that somewhere there will be one. And for the lunar ones, well, it, it's pretty much easier. Because on the whole, everybody can see the different lunar eclipses. So again, it's a very useful rule of thumb for calculating eclipses. Now, seeing these on the surface of this mechanism almost immediately tells you that this has a calendrical or eclipse prediction, some sort of use like that. It's an astronomical instrument of some kind. Okay, well, that was the surface imaging. Uh, the, actually, if you want to look at the surface imaging, all of this is available to you at Packard's California website. You can actually you can download it, play with it, look at all the Next thing was to try and give it a body scan. Now, in this way, we're very lucky to be loaned a machine by this company, XTech in Trade, who got interested in the um, program, uh, largely due to their managing director, a guy called Roger Hadman, and they gave freely of their time. They gave a great deal of time, they loaned us the machine, they came and operated the machine free of charge. It was a wonderful gesture of them to, to do so. They built us the highest energy X-ray machine they have ever built in order to make sure it could go penetrate the bronze of the instrument. And here it is. Uh, it was put on a lorry in showing that what you hang on a minute, you're saying. Look, you showed us the pieces, they fit very nicely into a small briefcase. So I'd assume that all I needed to do was go buy a nice first class ticket to Athens, you know, take them, bring them back, put them in the machine. However, even though I never even breathed the word either marble <laughs> or what was the name of the guy? <laughs> um, these things, the, this, the, the mechanism was not going to leave the Athens Museum. No way was this going to leave the, the Athens Museum. And that's right. This is it, it's quite crumbly now, this mechanism. And this is incredibly valuable. And I'd be quoted as saying this is more valuable than the Mona Lisa. Well, I think mean, that's right, because we do have other paintings by Leonardo. We have nothing comparable with this anti mechanism. So it's just priceless. And as I say, easily damaged, so it's perfectly fair that it should stay in the Athens Museum. So the only thing we can do is take this eight and a half ton extra machine to it. And that's what we did. It went through the streets in the early morning with the motorcycle outriders. And then into the basement through this gate, uh, into the basement of the museum. And yes, we did measure this gate before we started the on. <coughs> there it is. A lot of its weight is in the uh, lead shielding that's involved, because it's very high energy X rays. Um, I, I put the body scan, you wouldn't put a human body in there, or any animal body, it would just kill it. Uh, what it is used for, this, these machines, is used for examining things like turbine blades and jet engines or printed circuits. It's very, very high precision engineering x-rays that they do with these things. And you get some idea of the size from a computer monitor here. And here's one of our x-rays. Uh, I think you can see there's some quite nice detail on that. You can see the big uh, chariot wheel on there. But I don't think this really gives an idea of the three-dimensional stuff that I was really talking about. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a very short video and what we're going to do, this is, it has started, I think, we're going to zoom down through that fragment, look at different layers as we go down. We're just burrowing down through uh, the mechanism. I'll try to give a little bit of commentary as we go. Okay, you can see the beginning to appear, and you'll see in a moment that chariot wheel. Can you see the teeth coming here? See the teeth? <coughs> and here's the chariot wheel coming with bolts and things on. Quite a complex shaft at the centre there. What next? More complex shaft there. A gear wheel appearing there. Gear wheel, gear wheel, gear wheel. Funny sort of spacer thing there. Another gear wheel appearing there. Gear wheel there. Um, 
some sort of plate, gear wheels, but pin holding the gear wheel, and a funny sort of shaping thing here, another gear wheel there, a bigger gear wheel there. An absolutely huge gear wheel here with teeth on, with more gears mounted on it, some more gears down here, you begin to see teeth, you can see that. Now do you get some feel if you can get that sort of three-dimensional information about the um, object, we were hoping we would be able to get much more information about what it did. Now the first thing I wanted to do after we got this stuff was to count the teeth on the gears. Because once you've got the numbers of teeth, you can do the ratios, and as you know, being mathematicians, computer scientists, or dare I say physicists, numbers mean things. And if you can get those ratios, you can get some idea of what they're trying to do. However, it's not that trivial to count these gears, because as you can see, a lot of them are damaged, right, which doesn't help. And the other thing is, when they were made, these were cut by hand. So they're not entirely regular. Uh, what we did, in fact, was to measure an angular measurement from the centre and then devise a bit of software, basically, which, um, which did least squares fitting, essentially, of models moving the centre around in least square fitting models. And in fact, we were able to show that we've got most counts within one tooth, and one or two we could probably get within two teeth. So the actual results are pretty clear. And here are the tooth numbers for the gears. Um, hmm. Okay, fair enough. What do you say when you're faced with that lot of numbers? Well, there's so much look fairly straightforward, a 24 tooth gear, you're cutting out that 30 tooth, that'd be all right. But there's some other ones which are a bit odd. 53, for example, isn't the number you might first think of. 127, 188, 63, again, not the number you necessarily think of. These are used for, for particular things needed within uh, the apparatus, for example, 38 is 2 times 19. 19 was the number of years in the Metonic site, if you remember. And 235 in here occurs in the 188, because that's, if you multiply by 4 and divide by 5, which other years do, you've got your 235 for the Metonic cycles in there. Okay. What we hadn't expected would work as well was, in fact, not only were we able to count the teeth well, but we began to read more and more of the inscriptions. It turned out that the actual x-ray, this uh, tomographic x-ray, was a very good way of examining a description, like both just on or under the surface or inside the mechanism. When we started off, I think about 700 Greek characters were known. I think we're up above 3,000 now. So it's really, really given us a whole new Greek text uh, for this apparatus. Okay, so the front of the mechanism. It looked like that, as I say. As I said, there would have been something, a pointer, with a little, it actually says in the uh, inscriptions, there's a pointer with a little golden sphere on it. And then it mentions something about the sun, so we assume that's what it is. The pointer to show where the sun is, and there's this pointer, as I say, with a pointer to show where the moon is, with, in the sky. This is the zodiac around the, around the sky, showing where the sun and the moon are appearing. The back of the mechanism. Turn the main fragment round, Put that bit on there, that bit on there, that bit on there, easy when you know how. I'm now going to fade in the x-ray. Okay, <laughs> fade in the x-rays. Can you see there's a sort of bit at the top, a bit at the bottom there. Do you remember the picture I showed of the actual apparatus itself on the back dial, with the back dial at the top and the back dial at the bottom? You've just seen them there. So let's have a look at this top dial first. Okay, that's what they look like. Just as we were starting work, uh, Michael Wright noticed that these are not circular, these scales. They're spirals. The top is a five-turn spiral, and the bottom is a four-turn spiral. And in fact, they're defined by a slit, a groove. Now, the top one, we quite rapidly realised what it was, but we, rap we early on discovered a, an inscription saying the spiral divided into 235 sections. It was in Greek, by the way. We would have been worried had it been in English, or even more of it in Welsh, I suspect. But it, uh, it, it says that in the inscription, there's a spiral divided into 235 sections. Spiral, must be one of the dials, 235, and a tonic cycle. Bingo. And indeed, the top dial, the five turns, is, it's easy to show that the divisions are indeed 235. And what he was doing, in other words, is showing what month, lunar month, in the Metonic cycle was being shown. And there was a point to show you whereabouts around here you were. Now you think, hang on a minute, 
know. How would you know which of these where you're supposed to be on the dial if you had a pointer out from the center? Well, if you actually look at the x-rays, where are we? If you actually look at the x-rays, the, this is a, a, we found one of the pointers. And on the end of it, it has a pin. So what happens is the pin fits in the slot. And the arm can move out from the center pivot. So as the, over the, as the thing turns around, it pulls out the pointer from the centre axle. Rather, why do you remember the old gram vinyl? Gramophone? Yes, vinyl. Okay. Uh, the old gramophone records, the, the vinyl, where, where the needle was pulled across the record by the slot. Exactly the same um, idea. So what you had to do is just look at the end of the pointer, and the end of the pointer would tell you the direction you were supposed to be. That's a nice little bit of design, isn't it? Now, let me remind you where you are. 100 BC. Okay. Now, um, we also managed to work out uh, later on what the month names are. Now, the month names varied around the Mediterranean. And the month names on, on these dials correspond, in fact, to northwest part of uh, Greece, either up in northwest Greece here or over into Sicily, this sort of area. So whether that was where the machine was bound for or was designed to work in, we don't know, but it, the month names are characteristic of that area. Okay, now I'm going to show some gear trains. Now, as the computer scientists will probably be best about this, I think you're used to thinking about <coughs> algorithms and things. Uh, any engineers here? Right, well, then we don't have to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> all these gear diagrams are based on the idea that, that the top here, the main gear at the top here, is the chariot gear. <coughs> yeah, all right? That's the chariot gear. And the whole mechanism is based on the idea that one turn of the chariot wheel is one year. That's how it works. One turn of that is one year. It was driven by a little crown gear here, which had some sort of handle on the side of the machine. You'd have turned the handle on the side of the machine, and that would have turned this gear, which in turn would turn this big chariot gear around. Now, these gear diagrams are quite complicated. It takes about a month of staring at them to understand them fully. Then you know. um, so then I'm just showing to give some idea. Don't figure out to take all the information in. It's, you can't possibly take it all in just on a, a snapshot. Okay. Here's some of the game that's going to do the lunar motion later. But the ones I was showing to these dark, these um, the, this, the dial on the back, I just showed you showing the metonic side. It's also shows the perfect side as well, we believe. But that was sort of the train of gears down like that. And some of these still exist down to the show metonic cycle down here. Okay, what about the lower back dial? Well, the lower back dial is a four turn spiral. And if you look at some of the um, inscription or pictograms, pictograms, we called them glyphs when we first saw them. And apparently, that's what we should call them glyphs, um, like hieroglyphs. And can you see here's one of them? You can actually see it visually, it looks like that. Anybody guess what that means? Now, I thought that too. Well done. <laughs> It held us up by about seven months. <laughs> okay? Because it's, it's what, you know, among the astrophysicists used as the server side. In fact, that's a Greek nine. It's a theta. Now, remember I said that these, these uh, you remember theta, which is around with a line through the middle? <coughs> well, as I say, scripts varied over time. And that, in fact, is a theta. The time did vary, it become reduced like that. In fact, the sun is there. But as we'll see in a minute, the sun is coming from these symbols at the front here. Now, there's one of them, blown up. Nobody really knew what they meant, except had some idea that there might be some a solar or lunar sign. Uh, in the, in the x-rays, we discovered many more of these glyphs inside the machine, and I think we're up to about 18 now. And if I just phase in here the, uh, the lettering, <coughs> a lot of them have sigma, a lot of them have iota. The sigma stands for Elios, meaning sun. The sigma from Selene, meaning moon. And what these are is they say what months it's likely that an eclipse, either of the sun or of the moon, or both, will occur. We do this by looking at where they're positioned around the, the dial. The ones, can you see these ones which are 
I think it's the, yes, it's the turquoise ones here. See the turquoise ones, okay? <coughs> if the dial were full, the other ones would be there, but they're not, because uh, they're missing, because uh, we haven't got that with the apparatus. But for example, around here, we've got a glyph there and a glyph there, but no glyphs in between, you see. And if you consult old trips tables, my colleague, in fact, used whipped a bit of DNA matching software off the internet and matched up the eclipses with where the glyphs were. And lo and behold, yes, where these glyphs show is where you might expect on the sort of Seros cycle where there might have been a lunar or solar eclipse. So this style is to predict when is the likelihood of either a solar or a lunar eclipse based on the um, Seros cycle. And the 223 months around there. Okay. So how does that work? Well, here's the back of that main fragment. Can you see here, there's a great big wheel. If I do that, there's a great big gear wheel there. Can you see it? And if you might, difficult to see, but there's a great big gear wheel there. In fact, it's a double here. It's got one row of teeth, and then rather like jaws, underneath it it has another row of teeth riveted. So it's a big double gear. We call it the turntable gear. And that's down here. And all these gears exist that go down to show the uh, Sarah star down here. There's a thing called the Axe Enigma star. There's another subsidiary dial that has three quadrants in. Because remember I said that it was eight hours later. Well, if you go eight hours, then eight hours, and then eight hours, you're back where you started. So, in fact, you can use the thing for three cycles. And there's a little dial to show you which cycle you're in. Okay. Now, that gear all exists. We couldn't quite understand why they'd use this huge gear. They could have done it with a little train like this. They didn't have to use a big gear like this. So we thought, well, they're not very bright, are they? <laughs> big mistake. Very big mistake. That's all here. Yeah. But we wondered well, how it was driven, first of all, until we realised that this axle here is broken. It's broken off about here. And if you fit in, fit in a gear there, the right size to fit there, it would have about 27 teeth. If you put a 27 tooth gear in there, everything drives perfectly. So we're very confident that's what's happened. The gear is just missing there. Okay, but we still didn't really understand this, why they've done this. But we did notice that on that big gear, there's a block. Can you see it now? Can you see the teeth there? On this gear are mounted some other gears. Now there's a word for that, epicyclic gearing. Okay? <coughs> gears mounted on other gears. And we thought, well, what about those are about? Uh, and they're, they're mounted on this big gear. Why well, is that? And now, again, Michael Wright had been looking at this just before we started work, and he noticed that one of these gears, here's the x rays on here they are, they're not very big, these gears. He noticed that there was a slot in one of these gears. Uh, can you see that? You can actually see it visibly there. And you can see it in the x ray here. In fact, if I zoom in on the x ray, can you see there's a slot? And in the slot, there is a pin. Yeah? Okay. Now, why? Now, a bit more astronomy. If you go out from night to night, if you go out tonight, you'll see where the full moon is. Go out tomorrow night, the moon will have moved back in the sky. If you go out at the same time every night, you'll have noticed the moon moves backwards in the sky, haven't you? You will from now on. Okay? It moves back in the sky every night. Now, the question is, does it move back the same distance in the sky, the same angle, every night? Yes or no? Now, if the lunar orbit were a perfect circle, it would move the same amount every night. However, the lunar orbit is not a perfect circle. The Greeks knew it couldn't be a perfect circle. They didn't know, like we do, that the orbit of the moon is an ellipse. Right? Now, with our knowledge, the moon has an elliptic orbit. That means sometimes it's further away, sometimes slightly nearer. When it's further away, it moves slower. And because it's further away, it seems to move slower again. When it's nearer, it moves a bit faster. And again, because it's nearer, it appears to move somewhat faster. So in fact, the moon sometimes moves slightly faster in the sky from night to night, and sometimes slightly slower. And that's called the first anomaly of the lunar motion. And this first anomaly was known to the Babylonians and hence also to the Greeks. Now suppose you wanted to put that in mechanical terms so that 
the actual motion of the moon on this instrument actually did that. How would you do it? How about the following? Okay. We're going to have a drive to put the moon going round and round on the front. Okay. In that drive, suppose we did the following thing. Suppose we had a gear wheel going around. And we have another gear with the same number of teeth on next to it. And it drives that one round too. On that one that's going round here, let's put a, a pin. So the pin goes round like that. Following me so far? Right. Now I'll take another gear and put a slot in it and mount it above this gear. Right? So if it pushes that other gear round with a pin. However, mount the gears not on exactly the same axis. Mount them so they're slightly off axis of each other. So that when the bottom one pushes, sometimes it's slightly further away, sometimes slightly closer to the centre of the second gear. Can you see what's going to happen? Sometimes it'll push it a little bit faster, sometimes a little bit slower. Then take another gear and pick off the motion from that. So with four gears, you've got this device so that instead of just driving at a steady rate, there will be a quasi-sinusoidal variation in the motion. And when we examine this, the amplitude of that variation is exactly right to explain the first anomaly of the lunar motion. It's a staggering piece of mechanical design. Okay? And these gears are here, and the lunar motion comes down through these gears and then onto these pair of gears to do that, make that make that variation, then back up through the the front to show where the moon is. Now, <coughs> why on earth have they mounted it on this big turntable gear? Not just for convenience. We realised in the end why it is. Now, you know now, I hope, that the Earth, Moon, and Sun form a triple system. So, in fact, the gravitational influence of the Sun causes the lunar orbit not to stay still in space. It's an ellipse, but it's not stationary. It does what's called precession. It processes. So it turns around like this in space. So if you looked over a long time, it looks like a pretty flower petal pattern. Okay, over a period of about eight years. The result of that is that the variation in this, this variation in the lunar orbit doesn't occur at the normal lunar month period, but at a slightly different period. And in fact, by mounting those gears on this turntable gear, they have not only done the variation, but it's actually at the correct period that takes account of that precession of the lunar orbit. They didn't know about the precession, they knew the effect of it, and they modeled that into it. It's an astonishing piece of mechanical design. Okay, I'm going to hurry on, whoops. Um, we published this main results in nature in 2006. We still got some published in the following year, next year, hopefully. Um, the only time I've ever been involved in a media storm, it was great fun. Um, so, we know the Arctic calendar, it predicts eclipses, it shows the position of the moon in the zodiac, including the first anomaly, the position of the sun, the phase of the moon, and probably <coughs> planetary displays. Now, this is a difficult one. I'll come back to it in a minute, because the planetary mechanism is missing, alas. However, we did find another dial. On the main uh, month dial here, on that uh, metonic thing, there's another little dial, a four quadrant dial here. Here's a picture of it, four quadrant. Now, can anybody read that? Go on, have a go. Namir, right? Uh, I don't know if you can see the Namir up there. Anybody go that Isthmia? Anybody want to know what Namir and Isthmia are? They're panhellenic games, athletic games. And indeed, if you read carefully, Come on. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, it has a dial on to tell you when the Olympic Games are due. <laughs> How we can make money out of that last year, I'm not sure. <laughs> this is a complete surprise that it does have a, 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 a dial on that does show you which of the Panhellenic Games was due in a particular year. Now, whether this implies a social function as well as an astronomical function for this instrument, or whether it's just a way of orienting, because I say, you know, calendars are a bit dodgy around the Mediterranean, they should probably know which year the games were being held, so that might help orient you when you were using it. We just don't know. But it's certainly very interesting. It does indeed 
have a, a little dial to tell you when the particular pantheonic games are due. Okay, well there's the full uh, gearing as far as we know at present. Quite complex, let's say the lunar drive comes back up and onto the front. <coughs> so what's important about this? It's based on Babylonian period relations. The astronomy is perfect for the time. That's one of the things that's interesting. This is exactly the astronomy they knew at this period. Exactly. And that's great because it makes us believe we've got the date right. But it's also possible, therefore, it's actually a, a statement. Here, here, here's what we know about astronomy in the metallic form. That may even be a purpose, possibly. The design of the is superb. We have no idea that they were capable of such wonderful mechanical design. That's completely new. And um, there are literature, literature accounts of these devices. As I mentioned one of them. And in fact, I've been seeking them out uh, recently. And I'll talk about this just very briefly in a minute. If you read them, you'll think either this can't be true. Just, you know, but in fact, the devices were more complex than is implied by the literature sources. So what about the planets? Well, we've certainly found, found, the, found the word Aphrodite and Hermes, Aphrodite for Venus, Hermes for Mercury, and it mentions stationary points, which are where planets stop moving one way and move back in the sky. And almost certainly it did have a planetary mechanism at some point, but it's broken off, probably off the front. Here's one of the recently discovered uh, uh, decoded texts. Can you read that? <coughs> cosmos. Nice word to find in the machine, isn't it? Cosmos. And in fact, these lines seem to refer to the Moon, to Mercury, Venus, Sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Now, the more astute of you may have recognized that order, because that's typically the order that the planets, because they have regarded the Moon and Sun planets too in classical times, that's the order away from the Earth you would expect going out. So, this is almost certainly telling us about what was on the front of the mechanism, that they were displayed in that sort of way. But alas, it's lost. Uh, some of my colleagues have tried to reconstruct it. This is uh, a reconstruction of Tony Freeth and Alexander Jones, where they've actually put the planets on the front. They've invented some gearing which would allow the display of the planets on the front as well. And this thing now has, I know, about uh, 50 or 60 meters in. Now, like things that I like care, you know, when you're making flat packs, there's always one bit that you don't know where it went. And indeed, that's true of this mechanism too. There we still got one sixty-three tooth gear left over, so we don't know where that went. Although, if you're building a Mercury mechanism, <laughs> sixty-three teeth is a good one to have for a Mercury mechanism. I did did, did do some modelling with a student before we started this work, and when we made some simple Mercury mechanism, sixty-three gear, sixty-three tooth gear is what we use. So it's rather nice to find one. Okay, so what was it? Well, it was a calendar. It was an astronomical calculator. It was a, what would be called a telerium, which would show the relation of Earth, Moon, and Sun. Probably an orrery as well, as it showed planets. It was not a navigational device. It was found on a ship. This has nothing to do with navigation. Also, it's not an astrological device. As far as we can tell, there is nothing to connect this with astrology. It was, looks as though it was built for astronomy rather than astrology. It doesn't mean you couldn't use it for astrology, but it's not its prime purpose. Okay, I must rush on. I think it's got very interesting things I have got time to talk about. Is five more minutes all right? Ah, gracious me. I better stop after that. Right. Gracious me. I thought we had all the time in the world. There we are. Um, right, give me uh, 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Right, okay. Um, should we be surprised? No, they can make wonderful jewelry. Okay, that's where it probably came from. Road. Okay. Um, <laughs> No, they weren't accurate enough. Adding machines didn't come to much later. It's really until about uh, 1000 AD you began to get good enough gears and good enough mechanisms to start the adding machine kind of thing. But it wasn't, in fact, until around uh, 1200, 1300 that you began to get more complicated astronomical clocks. It wasn't until uh, a guy called Schickard in 15, 16 something or other, who with Kepler, designed a simple adding machine, and uh, Pascal, around 1642, began to do an adding machine that sort of worked, but they never really worked until uh, around the 19th century. And that's when the kind of computing took off. End of story. <laughs> Outside, but we've got a wine 
Would you step it up in Vrindamaluk following? If you'd like to come and join us, that would be lovely. Although, we might run out of wine quite quickly if you all come. Okay? Oh, no, I I'm sorry, no, I, I wasn't sure. Oh, and if you can bring the feedback forms to the farms as well, that would be excellent. Thank you. That would be very Sorry, Mike, I didn't realise that you didn't have a I'm going to have to be clear up and take it. I'll take questions in the reception. I'll get you some shots of you where it is. 